As usual, it's great to be back up here uh, again this morning to get back in the Word of God, and we're uh, cruising along in the apocalypse, the uh, book of Revelation. Today we're coming up on the uh, seventh seal, which unleashes the seven trumpet judgments, and today we're going to cover those first four in Revelation uh Chapter 8, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Where are we at in the uh, two Bibles? Uh, 12 something? 1223. 1223 in those blue uh, pew Bibles. And it says, Revelation chapter 8, starting in verse 1, When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was uh, given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the uh, incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. And then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now, in the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them, uh, the first angel blew his trumpet, and there was followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire, was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. Many people died from the water because it had made been made bitter. And the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Now I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time that we could gather here in your house uh, this morning, Lord. And we just uh, thank you that we can gather here and uh, that we're all here another week and uh, healthy for the most part. And we just thank you that we're able to be here. We thank you. Uh, we live in a place where we have the freedom to worship you. And we just want to lift up all those folks on our prayer request list this morning, Lord, that you be with them and their families, and those that are uh, sick, and those that have lost uh, loved ones, that you be with them. And we also want to thank you for all the answered prayers that you've answered out of our uh, little church here. And we know that prayer works, and we know that you're listening. And I just pray that you send the Holy Spirit upon us this morning to fill our hearts uh, so that we can learn from your word and apply it to our lives. And in Jesus' name, I pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. So, as most of y'all know, there are a lot of uh, disciplines involved when it comes to living uh, the Christian life, right? It's constant maintenance and uh, it takes a lot of discipline to live the Christian life. But there are few disciplines that are more difficult to cultivate than the discipline of prayer, right? You can talk to any Christian, and, you know, they'll all say, boy, I wish I had a better prayer life, or I wish I prayed more, or I wish I prayed better, or longer, you know, like me. I wish I didn't fall asleep laying in bed at night in the middle of my, my prayers, you know. They kind of trail off. And the reason for that is, is you know, because it, it, it's hard work. All right, prayer is, is hard work. You've got to concentrate. Your mind wanders. You've got to remember to do it. And another reason is because we don't always see the immediate results. 
And when you don't always see immediately immediate results to your prayers, you know, when that happens, we start to believe that maybe it's just kind of a, a wasted effort. You know, it's kind of a waste of time. But if you ever start to feel that way, all you need to do is look at Revelation chapter 8 here uh, to see what God does with our prayers as we are engaged in spiritual warfare. What unfolds in this chapter is an amazing truth. Okay, our prayers ascend to heaven and unleash the power of God in judgment on evil. And our prayers matter. And they work for God's glory and, and our good. And Alfred Lord Tennyson once said, More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. And, you know, I suspect in light of Revelation, he had no idea how true those words were. And we see three things unfold in this chapter, starting with the first one. Uh, if you're taking notes, number one on your outlines, there on the back of the bulletin is uh, heaven's silence in verses one and two. And it's well said that, you know, it is often, you know, quietest before the storm. Okay, the stillness and silence can almost, you know, take your breath away in anticipation uh, of what may come. And, you know, especially nowadays, you know, we all have weather apps on our on our phone you know we all check the radar and, and and you know when a when a storm is coming you can look at the radar right and they always seem to come out of the west those worst bad storms and you can look on your radar and see that red line coming right at you and you know that storm is, is coming despite the fact that when you look out your window it's nice and calm and peaceful outside right but you know it's coming and the calm before the storm are appropriate words when they are applied to the uh, trumpet judgments of Revelation 8. And Revelation 8, 1 speaks of silence in heaven, but only for a half hour, uh, a short time. So judgment, almost too great to imagine, will quickly follow. And when it's finished, uh, a third of God's glorious creation will be gone, destroyed by the God who created it. And these judgments recall the plagues uh, God poured out on Egypt and, and the story of uh, Joshua and the battle of Jericho. And in both of those scenes, God moved in response to the cries of his people. And now God's going to do it again as the sovereign Lord Jesus acts in response to the prayers of his people. And the prayers of God's people are an important theme, not only throughout the whole Bible, but especially here in Revelation. They were first mentioned in 5a. In uh, chapter 6, verse 10, we saw martyred believers crying with loud voices for justice. Now in chapter 8, the prayers of the saints are noted uh, again. And in light of the judgments that we saw in chapter 6 and those that will follow, the response of Jesus to the prayers of his people just kind of takes on an even greater significance. So we see in verse 1 there, chapter 8, verse 1, the lamb who took the scroll from the father, uh, back in 5-7, if you remember that, and he began to open the seals in 6-1, he now breaks open that seventh seal. And it says, all of heaven is suddenly silent for about <coughs> a half an hour. So the heavenly hosts, you know, kind of wait with anticipation to see what the Lord Jesus, the, the warrior lion lamb, will do next as he judges the earth for its idolatries, immorality, and rebellion against his rightful authority. But why is heaven silent? What's with the quiet? Well, some believe it allows time for God to hear the prayers of the saints in verses uh, 3 and 4. And that's certainly possible, but not likely but what is more certain is that it makes the upcoming judgments even more impressive as the suspense builds you know it's kind of like at the end of a trial you ever seen a trial you know maybe on tv or whatever well everybody waits in anticipation for the jury to deliberate right everybody's waiting what's the jury gonna say guilty or not guilty 
A similar idea can be seen in several Old Testament passages. In Habakkuk 2.20, it says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let everyone on earth be silent in his presence. Zephaniah 1.7 says, Be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. Zechariah 2.13 says, Let all people be silent before the Lord, for he is coming from his holy dwelling. <laughs> it's a common theme. Sometimes we sit here and say, Well, why isn't God speaking to me? Well, maybe it's because you haven't shut up long enough to listen, right? The hour of God's final judgment has come, and the hour when the saints will be vindicated and sin punished and Satan vanquished and Christ will finally be exalted once and for all. And we see in verse 2 there that God uses his angels to carry out his will. And some of the time, it is in specific response to our prayers. And I go back to Daniel chapter 10. There was an angel's response to Daniel's prayer that makes this clear. It says there in verses 12 and 13, Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. So angels and, and demons are engaged in, you know, warfare in the spiritual realm, you know, that, that in a manner we could never truly uh, imagine. And I've said it before, and I'm sure I'll say it many more times, that if we could actually see what was going on behind the scenes in the spiritual realm with you know, angels and demons, you know, we'd probably pee our pants. It'd probably be a, a terrifying thing, you know, to see. Just all that going on. So maybe it's better if we don't, you know, see it. But in Revelation 8-2, our sovereign Lord gives seven trumpets to the seven angels who stand before God. Now, according to Numbers 10, you know, Trumpets called the people together, announced war, and proclaimed special times and events. In uh, Exodus 19, they were sounded at Mount Sinai when the law uh, was given. In Joshua 6, when Jericho fell. And in 1 Kings 1, when the king was enthroned. And a trumpet is going to sound, and the trumpet that we're all waiting for, uh, at the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4. And when Christ returns, that we see in Matthew 24. These trumpets in chapter 8 are end times, trumpets of judgment that will happen in you know, the tribulation in the future. And Christ, with all authority in heaven and on earth, summons his angels to carry out his will on earth, as well as the prayers of the saints. Okay, which brings me to my second point today, which is uh, number two, if you're taking notes, is saints' supplications. Got heaven's silence and saints' supplications. And Adrian Rogers once said, When there's no hope on the horizontal level, there is always hope on the vertical level, right? Sometimes we take that in reverse order. We try to do all this out here uh, on our own. And when that fails, then we pray, right? We should have prayed first. It's where you start. So. And how many times in your life have you known that to be uh, true, you know? You're at the end of your rope and you pray and God pulls you up. Well, prayer activates us and engages us in, in, in spiritual warfare in the present and also the future. And, and spiritual warfare is a war that's not to be entered lightly. Ephesians 6.18 tells us that prayer is essential. As we engage in spiritual battle... And, and, you know, must be constant, alert, and persevering. And we should offer these prayers and, and supplications, not only for ourselves, but, you know, for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ out there across the world. Because make no mistake about it, okay, there are demons out there who are fighting you and who want to destroy you. They'd like nothing better than to destroy you. They'd like nothing better than to keep you discouraged and ineffective and keep you living a compromised life. 
But our prayers are effective. Our cries go up and his, and his, his kingdom comes down. And God is faithful. Okay, he will demonstrate his power. He will vindicate his people, extend his mercy, and uphold his justice in the end. You know, but unfortunately, most Christians do not consider prayer to be anything at, at all like this. But it is. Okay, look at our passage at the presence of our prayers in heaven and, and the power they unleash. Ver, verse 3 says... Uh, Another angel, which is separate from the seven uh, trumpeters, comes before the altar of God with a golden censer. So that's just a thing you burn incense in, an incense burner. And we know that this is the altar of incense because he was given much incense to offer. However, something unique and unusual is to be mixed with the incense as he offers it before the golden altar in before the throne. And verse 4 says, it is the prayers of the saints. Okay, that's us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, you are a saint, despite what your wife or husband or your mom says. And it's mixed both the incense and the prayers of the saints, and it rises as a sweet aroma and fragrance before God. So this scene in heaven suggests that there's something sacrificial about genuine prayer. And, and both the believer and his prayer enter the presence of God by way of the altar. And for centuries, the saints of God have talked, you know, to God in prayer, prayer for his kingdom, asking for his will to be done, for his kingdom to come uh, on earth. And those prayers have not been in vain. Okay, those prayers have been heard and those prayers that, that Satan tries to thwart and, and, and block by his demonic host do get through to heaven. That's why he wants to keep you, you know, so busy you, you just think you don't have time to pray. He'll do anything he can to keep you from praying. But they got through. Now they ascend before God and he delights in their fragrance. And after our prayers rise up, notice what the angel does in verse 5. The angel takes the incense burner filled with fire from the altar and he throws it to the earth. And there follows peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Okay, so there's a storm of brewing, as we say. I tell my kids that when I'm looking at my radar and you can see that line of storms coming, right? Kids, there's a storm of brewing. A storm's coming and it flows out of the prayers of verses 3 and 4. The language of these verses is uh, kind of reminiscent of Mount Sinai with its thunder and lightning and earthquakes in uh, Exodus 19. Also the vision of Ezekiel 10 where a man you know, clothed in uh, linen fills his hands with fire and scatters it over the city. And intercession and prayer have turned to judgment, not according to man's timetable, but God's. So the angel cast fire under the earth, followed by harbingers of impending storm and disaster. Now the earth trembles before the presence and power of its creator. So a day of reckoning has arrived. And those seven angels are prepared to blow the seven trumpets. Romans 12, 19 reminds us, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So there is a day coming when God will make things right. The trumpet judgments are a portion of that day. And we need to wait on him. He hears our prayers. He will not be late. He will be right on time. So we've seen silence in heaven in anticipation and the prayers and supplications of the saints. And then here's the third point uh, this morning, which is God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. So an important lesson to be learned here is that God's delays are not God's denial. Just because he's delayed a little while doesn't mean he's said no, right? There's three answers to prayer. Yes, no, and wait a while. 
Matthew uh, 6, 9 to 13, we find uh, what we call the model prayer, right? The Lord's Prayer. And there Jesus tells us in verse 10 to pray, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that prayer is once more being answered in these trumpet judgments of Revelation 8 and 9. If you look back at uh, chapter 6, verse 8, those seal judgments of chapter 6 saw the destruction of the fourth of the earth. Now the trumpet judgments will see the destruction and devastation of a third of the earth. And, and that phrase, a third, occurs 12 times in chapter 8. And each one's like the tolling of a bell with the impending judgment. So the precise nature of each trumpet, it's not altogether clear. You're going to find different people interpreting these things in a number of different ways as to precisely what they are, but what's important are that the end results are plain and tragic. These judgments recall the plagues of uh, Exodus, which God visited on Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And the first four trumpets of chapter 8 are natural in that they affect the land, the salt water, fresh water, and stellar bodies of stars in heaven and space, stars sun and moon. And then the fifth and sixth trumpets of chapter 9 unleash demonic forces that torment and then kill. So the seventh trumpet in chapter 11 is going to constitute the seven bowls of chapter 16. So in the blowing of the first four facets of God's sovereignty over his creation are revealed as he acts in response to the pleas of his people. So we see in verse 7 the first of the angels it says there in verse 7, blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the grass, green grass, was burned up. So again, that imagery is like the seventh plague that God brought on Egypt in Exodus 9. But the difference in this plague is that of intensity. Okay, burned up occurs three times in just one verse. So whatever it literally is, whether it's meteor activity or volcanic activity or unprecedented storms like we've never seen before, whatever this is, great devastation follows this cosmic storm that had its beginning in heaven. And then it's a third indicates that although God is bringing punishment on the earth, it's not yet complete and final. Okay, so the purpose of this judgment is to warn people of the full wrath of God yet to fall, and in so doing, bring them to repentance. Okay, that's what these are for. Tragically, however, most will not repent, as we'll see next week in chapter 9. Now, we do know from our past passages, that there are, during the tribulation, when it comes, there will be millions upon people, you know, repenting and believing in Christ, okay? It's going to be a revival upon the earth like you've never seen before. There will be millions, but that means billions won't, okay? Right now, we're at 7.8 billion people on this planet, okay? Even if 100 million repent, you know, that's 7.7, .7, it won't. These words fulfill what Jesus promised and prophesied in the uh, Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Okay, patterns of this judgment have occurred throughout history. However, in the day of the Lord, that great tribulation, it reaches a fever pitch. Nothing's going to escape this terrible judgment. And whatever these images represent, the impact should, you know, just rattle our bones in awe of God. And next we move into the second trumpet in uh, verses 8 to 9. Romans 8, 22 says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And that verse reminds us that all creation has been groaning since uh, Adam and Eve were defeated by Satan They're back in the Garden of uh, Eden. And I can only imagine its pain during... This time of horrific and cataclysmic judgment. However, in response to the prayers of the saints, these judgments are actually Satan's defeat. 
and, and a prelude to creation's redemption. All right, so all those prayers we've all poured out for the last several thousand years. You know, God, why don't you do something about evil and bring your justice? Well, here it is. <clears throat> says in verse 8, John sees something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. So, you know, that vision can't really be fully captured with human language. Could be a monstrous volcano that erupts on the ocean floor. Could be a meteor. Considerable amount of time is, you know, devoted by the Space Administration and, you know, NASA and dudes out with their telescopes military organizations to find a way to deter a meteor of considerable size, you know, that would potentially be headed towards the earth. You know, Hollywood movies have been made about, oh, we got to, you know, destroy that meteor before it hits the earth. And, you know, there goes Bruce Willis with his drill up to space, you know, something like that. So whatever this is, the results in verse 9, it's just a matter of time, are that a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. And again, judgment recalls uh, the first Egyptian plague where the rivers were turned to blood, killing the fish and making the water undrinkable in Exodus 7. And this is language that would have certainly terrified the first century readers because those sea lanes and a lot of their food you know they they were kind of they were called the lifeblood of rome because the romans were so dependent on the sea for both food and commerce that's how they moved goods and stuff you know through the sea we still do right imagine that none of our junk's going to come over from china nothing to buy at walmart and on amazon right we still depend on it so it's difficult to imagine such an extensive, you know, judgment, but the judgment is partial, not total. Okay, so time is running out for the defiant and idolatrous earth dwellers, but it's not completely gone. Not yet. And that brings us to the third trumpet in 10 and 11. So the third trumpet blows and a great blazing star named Wormwood falls from heaven on a third of the rivers and springs and it's kind of you know anybody who's dealt with revelation at all you know that sounds familiar right wormwood the waters become wormwood many people die from its bitter poison and this judgment's both a parallel to the first egyptian plague again that contaminated the fresh water and a reversal of the experience of the children in israel in the wilderness of mara right where the Lord made bitter water drinkable in Exodus 15. And the word wormwood appears only here in the New Testament. Uh, it's mentioned eight times in the Old Testament where it's associated with bitterness and poison and death. Nothing good. And that it's a third again tells us it is partial. That it comes from heaven tells us it's a sovereign act of God in response to the pleas of his people Again, in verses 3 and 4. So again, this could be another meteor. This could be the result of a, an atomic explosion making the waters uh, radioactive. You know, John could have seen a missile streaking across the heavens. You know, I still think there's probably a life out in the sea still dying from a radioactivity and, uh, from Fukushima, right? So it's probably the former, but again, the end result is indisputable. The springs and the rivers that provide our drinking water are poisoned, and many people die as a result. And the water becomes bitter and poisonous, and the inhabitants of the earth become even more familiar with the bitterness and death of God's just judgment. Now the fourth trumpet in verse 12. The fourth trumpet sounds, and a third of the starry heavens are darkened with an accompanying effect of darkness on the earth. Once again, this plague looks back to the ninth plague in Egypt in Exodus 10. Uh, Amos 5.18 teaches us that the day of the Lord will be darkness, not light. The darkness of the fourth trumpet anticipates the demonic activity of chapter 9 and even greater sorrow and uh, whether people want to take these things symbolically or literally, like I do, I take these things uh, 
literally. And in a year like 2020, it's easier to take these things literally right because they're easier to believe now. It's just a reminder that all things in heaven and on earth are passing away. 2 Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So the purpose of the first four trumpet judgments is primarily to disprove the earthly, you know, gods and idols that man has created and to show that Yahweh alone is on the throne. And by kind of repeating a variation of the uh, Egyptian plagues, God wants to make his omnipotence known to the world. Just kind of show how futile it is of trying to turn against him. So each of these judgments addresses a different aspect of life in the ancient world and in the modern world as well. Okay, the first shows that the material world is no answer. Second and third address the sea trade, including food supplies. Okay, we're all dependent on stuff moving, trucks, trains, planes, trains, automobiles. The fourth focuses on life itself in the heat and light of the heavenly bodies. So those four together prove that those who live only for this world have chosen foolishly because for only in God is their true life. Okay? Earthly things are going to deteriorate. They're going to break down. Uh, they're going to turn on us. So we dare not depend on them. Then verse 13, And I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice, as it flew directly overhead, whoa, 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 to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. So it's just getting warmed up here. Which we'll get into those next week. So to wrap it up here, uh, a main takeaway for y'all living out here right now today, September uh, 27th, year two thousand. 20 is that all this started with prayer okay prayer is an action of you know limited sinful human beings like us that in some amazing and mysterious way moves into action uh, a sovereign god and even though i can't fully explain it i do believe it okay charles spurgeon said prayer is a gift from god as well as appeal to god Every prayer for mercy is not a cause, but a result. Divine grace is at the back of prayer and at the base of prayer. And that's true on the universal level, but also true on the personal level. Prayer is what moves God to judge the world and vindicate his saints. And prayer is also what moves God to save souls and bring them into his kingdom. Okay, so time is short. Folks, time is short. If anything, I know we're a day closer than we were yesterday, right? But we're starting to see this convergence of events out there. These signs, you know, used to all happen apart. Now they're just all happening, you know, together, all close together. You know, it's called the convergence of events. But you got to remember, you know, Judgment's coming for everybody. Even if you're not here for the trumpet to sound in the, in the rapture, you know, you only get so many years on this earth. And nobody's guaranteed anything, you know. I hate to say it, but something bad could happen on your ride home from church today. You know, somebody's texting or dropped something on the phone when they're passing you and they swerve over into the lane and that's it. Your time's up. Okay, salvation is always just a prayer away. So Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone means everyone or anyone. Good things to remember. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time we could gather here once again in your house. Uh, Lord, and just want to thank you for this passage, which, if anything, is just a reminder that prayer works and that we all only have so much time on this earth. And 
There is coming a day when you're going to right all wrongs and wipe out uh, all evil. And what a day that will be. And Lord, I just uh, thank you that you are in control and that you do have a plan, even though we live in days where it doesn't seem like it. Uh, there's nothing that goes on that you haven't uh, allowed to happen or planned. And I pray that this passage this morning would motivate us to be prayer warriors uh, for Christ and your kingdom. I want to lift up all those on our list again uh, this morning. And also, thank you again for all your answered prayers. And we just thank you for all that you do. And we thank you that you're coming again. And in Jesus' name, I pray and give thanks. Amen. All right. So uh, here we are. And uh, your day has come, my friend. And, we're glad y'all have come and been a part of our church, I'm sure. And, uh, and uh, maybe one day you'll find a job right around here. Right. I mean, a job is something to do. But, uh, it's good to have you. We're, uh, you know, Howard, and uh, so he's come forward to get baptized today. And you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Absolutely. Correct. Okay. And are you coming today uh, to make a public profession of faith? I am. Following the footsteps and commands of the Bible? Yes. All right. Absolutely. Go ahead and cross your arm. All right. How much do you weigh, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, less than he used to. <laughs> if I start kicking and fighting, I'm taking him down with me. <laughs> Well, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I now baptize you, and buried in the likeness of Christ's death, and raised to walk in the newness of life. Yeah, the floor is slicked there a little bit. That's all right. All right. All right, cool. Woo. All right. <laughs> you feel better? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, lead us in another song and uh, stick around and he'll change up and uh, we'll have him come down and y'all can shake hands with him and on your way out.